Uh, we will get it underway. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, we've got uh, three three great speakers today. Um, so we do have quite a lot of content to get into. So really looking forward to this. Um, and let's get started. Um, just a bit of housekeeping to start with. Um, I've already started the recording, so this meeting uh, will be recorded, and we will once again upload it to the um, YouTube channel um, that Blue Band runs. So we've got all of our previous online ones up there already, which have got some good hits already, and you can already find the other Sydney ones and some of the other global groups as well if you're interested. Um, so just get everyone to mute themselves now if, if you can, just to uh, reduce any background chatter. Um, and uh, we'll see how we go with the bandwidth, but um, let us let us know if it's bogging down, but um, people may want to turn their cameras off if, if we're having any problems there. And as Lockie said, um, as as people run through, um, just uh, pop any questions or, or feel free to um, type away in the chat as well um, about any of the, the content today or, or anything more generally. Um, so yeah, as I said, uh, the agenda today, we'll just do some brief introductions and um, a bit about uh, Melbug and other bugs, um, and then we'll get straight into that content, uh, which we'll introduce as each one of those uh, gets underway, but some really great content we've got there today. Um, so Melbug is, uh, as some of you would know, this is our uh, third online, or second, second, is it a third? Third online one, I think. Yeah, third online one. We got one uh, underway uh, in person just before COVID hit. Um, and, you know, things are looking pretty positive in Melbourne. We may have a chance to run something in person. Um, we'll see how that goes. Um, not sure if many businesses will um, commit to having that, that many people. Uh, you know, we've got some good numbers now. We've almost got 40 in this session now. Um, we had a lot of RSVPs, so um, I think it's I think it's uh, really growing, and, and really pleased to see that growth in in these times. But um, you know, we're an industry-led group, and we do have some support from Bluebeam. Um, and uh, you know, the the idea for me particularly was to get together people from various different industries um, to really share knowledge about this. I think it's one of those platforms that really does have a massive broad cross section of people, right from engineering through to through to clients you know specifiers people using it for their quantity takeoffs uh, all sorts of things and 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 it's it's one of those one of those ones i think that gets that really good cross section from the industry um, there is a there is a whole uh, suite of these user groups all around the world and that's growing all the time um, and we work closely with that group and our team has uh, has a, a champions uh, Group that we're part of that we can um, we can tap into as well and 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 we like to uh, see what's happening around the globe so we do try and bring that back to some of uh, some of this group um, but definitely look out for the Sydney group as well who run pretty regular um, sessions um, about a week before us generally we try and coordinate that um, and uh, they've got some great content there as well um, but more recently the UK. Uh, user groups have been putting up some really interesting content that aligns with a lot of the same things we're doing here as well. Uh, so a bit about myself, um, I'm the chairperson of the group and working at ACOM um, and uh, we've got a team of other uh, champs across the across this group that's working really well together this year. So we have uh, Sing Sing um, at CPB and then Lachlan as well from ACOM that I work closely with and um, and Shanak, the um, the guru with Bluebeam, um, who's uh, working with Mind Systems. So um, uh, we're all contributing to this, and and really, it's been quite easy uh, for us in 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 this year. And um, the 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 effort uh, from from all of you to volunteer to speak is is making it really quite quite seamless for us. That's the effort for us to get this content and and make sure we're presenting something to to you guys. Um, that's interesting each month. Um, so thanks to everyone who has put put themselves forward. Um, so the speakers we have today um, is is quite a broad selection, and um, I'm really excited to have some international content there as well um, with Troy. Um, so that's that's really exciting. Um, and uh, and and then. Um, 
you know, some some overlaps between the type of content that they're showing here as well. And that's um, still really focused on uh, a lot of it around the cloud work sharing um, functionality. Um, and, and we'll see uh, that as a highlight uh, through most of this content. Um, so yeah, I'll each one of those uh, as we get to their topics. Um, so first of all, we've got uh, Brendan. Um, he's going to give some overview into how WSP use their um, use Bluebeam within their organization. And um, I, I haven't uh, actually met uh, Brendan before, but we just had a, a quick catch up previously and um, and Shan knows him from some previous employers. Um, but uh, interestingly, um, Brendan's been using his time on YouTube by the looks of it in the last uh, few months. And there's some actually some really interesting content there. So. Um, I'm sure he's going to mention that a bit further, and I think some of that uh, stuff that he's got today ties into it. But yeah, some um, some really interesting content uh, that he's got uploaded on his channel there. Um, so I'll hand it over to you, Brendan, to talk about Bluebeam. Yeah, well, yeah, well, I'm Brendan, as as Ben was saying, and I'm an associate at WSP, and I've done a lot of work at WSP up up and down the east coast, and. As Ben was saying, also in August, I actually started a YouTube channel, which you can link down below, obviously. But today we're going to be talking about Bluebeam and really using it to power your markups and really extending that use case from what your standard markup is. So when we're looking at a good markup procedure, so what is a good markup procedure? It needs to be clear and understanding so you can pass across the information that you're trying to determine. You need to have some sort of quality assurance as well. So some sort of back checking and making sure those markups are getting done. And it's really critical that it's been going to be quick and efficient because if it's not quick and efficient, people aren't going to use it. So they're not going to utilize it as, as required. So these are the key aspects when you're setting up your market procedure, what you need to look for. So if we're ever looking at traditional markups, we would generally do a red pen markup. So we're just marking up that we need changes on a drawing, what those changes are. And we'll generally hand that to a draftee to, or a modeler to change the markups as needed. This is getting even more complicated with the time of COVID. We're working from home, so we would do that red pen markup. We would first need to print it off, mark it up, scan it. So it gets quite a long time. You've got all these delay times in between to get the markups out. So people have been going more and more into using Bluebeam, but they're only really using Bluebeam essentially the same as that red pen markup, just using the red pens, needing the changes, and not really extending the requirements of Bluebeam. Now, if we look across to the right, yes, you can extended a little bit, but it's essentially the same thing. We've just made the markups pop a little bit more with a highlighted background. But this is generally how people try and use Bluebeam when they're using it. They're not really extending it beyond. So what we can do is essentially utilize color because it helps determine that clarity in the markup a bit more and also defines the different type of markups you may have on a drawing. So at WSP, we've essentially broken it down to a number of different colors that determine different things. So if we're looking at red, red is your standard markup procedure. So that is, you need a direct change. Are you telling the modeler to change something directly on your drawing? So that is doesn't really change from your standard red pen markup, but now we've added green and blue. So green is if you've got a question or a comment, so you may need some sort of change on your documentation. So we need something changed a certain way. You need to look at the architectural drawings to make sure it matches, or you just have some sort of question like, what has the architect done at this location? So that's where the engineer would write to the modeler is saying, can you please provide a little bit of clarity on this? And then we also have blue, which is so you, you may have had response back to that green comment, or even if they've made something change, but they've actually missed something on the architectural drawing is where the modeler would write back in blue. So we can clearly define those markups as we're going through, so we can clearly see what each one of those are. Now for a little bit of that QA procedure, you can also have a highlighting procedure as well, where you're highlighting in yellow each of the markups to make sure that each of the markups have been done. So you're highlighting the documentation and then the engineer would then get that document back and then could highlight that in green. So they're highlighting in green, ensuring so there's a double check at that procedure. So now you have essentially a document that you can save onto the server that has all the markups done, highlighted off. So it closes that QA procedure. But we can extend, extend this even further with Lubin. And what we can do is essentially build a tool chest off to the side with a different markup procedure in there. So we can extend the markup a bit further. And now this also makes the markups even more powerful because it will make it searchable and also defines each one of the, what they are. So it's clearly definable depending on who, who you are, who's using it. And now there's no confusion between each one of them. As they've got a description and a call out, what each one of them 
which each one of them do, you can clearly def work out which way they're going. Now, these are also trackable. So we'll move into Bluebeam and have a brief look at how we can utilize this. Now, let's just open Bluebeam and pray around with this generic markup to see how it actually works. As you can see, I've highlighted our tool chest that's already set up. And at the top of the page, you can also see a thing called My Tools. So what we're able to do is click and drag our generic markup items into our My Tools and essentially customize it for whatever we need. So depending on the, what the markups are, who we are and how we're utilizing it. This can be either on a project by project basis or even a computer by computer basis. So you can really set it up depending on what you're doing for the day. So it's fully customizable depending on what you're trying to answer. There's either two ways we can utilize this. You can either click on them and by clicking on them, essentially it allows us to grab that markup tool that we're using. However, this can be quite slow and cumbersome and there is a better way. And when we're looking at efficiencies, we have to go no further than looking at pro gamers. So when they're setting up their design for their how they're going to be efficient as possible, they're heavily utilizing keyboard shortcuts. There's very minimal mouse movement. Most of the action is on the keyboard to improve their efficiencies. We too can utilize this to power our blue beam. If we look back up at the My Tool Chest, there's a series of numbers up there. This effectively gives us shortcut keys that we can utilize when doing our markups. So essentially by hitting the number three, it allows us to grab that tool in the tool chest. So as you can see here, we've grabbed number three, and we're saying, let's change this to two and twenties. So what we're actually able to do as well is resize that using the old set command. It's just a pro tip. So when you are using text box, Using the old Z command allows you to resize any text box to match the words that are actually in it. So we can see here, we now type old Z again, and it will resize it to the exact size that we need. So now let's just add another couple of markups and we'll speed through here. I've actually sped this up quite a lot, so we don't spend all the time doing all the markups on this drawing sped up to 700 soon but as you can see when you are looking at it most of the time i'm not using the mouse very much i'm using a lot of those keyboard shortcuts to grab from from our tool chest so as you can see it essentially speeds up the design as much as possible and really gets us as efficient as we need to so when we are going to this and we finish our marker we can have a look at the bottom of the page if we pull up the bottom of the blue beam you can see there is now a series of defined variables and if we click on them we can essentially flick through all the markups we have in this document what we can also then do is filter it even further so if we just want to look at the correction notes we type in correction in the bottom command and it allows us just to define those correction notes now if we go through the document we can see the only ones that are highlighted in this document are those correction commands. There's no other markups specifically highlighted in here so we can able to quickly flick through to find where they are as you can see the other markups are grayed out. Further to this, we can also create a PDF that lists all the markups we've got there. And because we've actually redefined that correction note, it'll only provide the correction notes in there. So we just go through and just filter out any of the status boxes that we don't need. So essentially customizing it for this document. And then by extracting it, we now have an extracted document. And as you can see here, it's just listed each of those markups. And if we set this up correctly, they do actually have hyperlinks, as you can see. So now let's have a look at that. We can go back, click those hyperlinks, and it jumps to where we need to. Let's try that again. Let's go to the back of the document. We'll click on one of the other hyperlinks. As you can see, it takes us to where you want to go. So again, if we wanted to filter out something else for this situation, we'll just filter out the alerts. And by filtering out the alerts, we now can only see the alerts on the document. So let's flick through that. We can see that now the alerts will be the highlighted markup as opposed to the correction, which was before. So we've essentially changed it. Now what we can do now is also then filter it out and get it back up to those hyperlinks. Now we have both amended to the document, the original one that we called up and the alerts. So we're able to customize the things that we see at the end. For those of you who don't know, we can also power this further through sessions. Sessions allows us to upload our PDFs to an online repository 
which then can be accessed by multiple people at the same time. So we can have multiple people working up on the same drawing at the same time. So we can have a couple of people working on different documents or different areas in the document or even on the exact same PDF. And we can provide these markups in real time back, back and forth to people. It also defines on who's actually done what markup. So if we want to go back and see who's actually doing the markups on our drawings, we'll actually see who's actually done these as well. And as per our other PDF, you can see down the bottom here, we have all the markups listed down there. And further this, we can now also create replies back and forwards in this document. So the drafties had a look at what the engineers actually said to realign them. However, when he's looked at the architectural drawings, he's realized they cannot be realigned because the architect set it out in a specific location to match with the wall mullions. So he's just writing back, I'm not doing this because of the architectural set out. This is where the architect set out these rafters. Do you actually want to change it or do you want to leave them where they are? So now the engineer can come in and say, reply to that response as well. In this case, situation, he didn't realize the set out was done by the architect. So he just said, leave them where they are as a response back. So essentially closing out that RFI. And further this, you also have a status bar. As you can see up the top corner, we have a thing called status. And this status bar allows us to either set the changes. So we can either do it accept and it says what times it's been accepted and who's actually accepted it as well. This is really powerful for closing out your QA procedures as you can essentially close out all the RFIs you've got on this document this way. And now similar to what we did before, we can also create an amended PDF at the back of the document, which will also track all the changes as well. So if we just go back into the bottom, we define that PDF, we grab the PDF, and then we just make sure that we've got amend to PDF at the top corner, which I'm circling now. By having that checkbox, we press OK. It will add this at the end of the document with those defined links. So it allows us to have the hyperlinks as well. Now, if we scroll through this as well, we can also see the replies are in there. So we can see if there was any discussions had on this document and what the answers were. So as we can see, this can be really powerful, especially for teams working digitally, which is happening more and more nowadays. And it's likely to happen even more as we extend into the future. You can see by doing this, we can essentially power our markups even more effectively. So both by utilizing the tool chest by moving them up into my tools as well, so we can get those shortcut keys and amending this at the back of the document. We can see we've got a really powerful QA procedure along with a quick and easy access guide to, so we can track the changes and look at what's happening. It allows multiple team members to work on it at once. Now let's just open Blue. And you, you don't have to actually necessarily be limited to that markup procedure as well. Obviously, sometimes your markup procedures need to change on a project by project basis. So you can actually grab the tools and here you can see I've created a little legend down to the bottom where I've changed the markup procedure slightly. And this allows me to really customize it on a project by project basis. So for whatever reason that you need some additional clarification on those changes, so you need some sort of change to the markup procedure, you can actually customize it as well. So you don't necessarily need to be limited to what you've done in the tool chest. But as you can see, this is can be a really powerful way of powering your markups and it also provides that QA procedure. So it's both achieving that efficiencies that we're starting at, at the top, it's improving the clarity through having different colors so they actually know what each defined name is and closing out that QA procedure all in one area. So this can be really powerful when you're powering your blue boom and moving away from just that red pen markup is really useful. So that, that's currently what I was planned for today for my presentation. And I don't know if there was any questions. That, that was really good, Brendan. I think we had it. We did have a few questions coming through on the line and they were sort of mostly around just clarifying the, um, the tool chest with the shortcuts. And I think it's yep. kind of been addressed a little bit, but it was a, if you just sort of iterate about the um, the shortcuts of using the numbers on my tools. The question was whether yep. you could also create shortcuts for your other tool chests items. Yeah, you have to move them into, as far as I'm aware, correct me if I'm wrong, but you have to move them into the my tool chest, but you can move any tools into there. So if you've got a different market procedure or you're doing a, 
any markup procedure. So just what, whatever you're doing, it doesn't necessarily need to be limited to the, the one you've made. But if you made a tool chest and you've got those little tools, if you drag them into the My Tool Chest, they'll be defined with a shortcut key. So yeah. you can customize it for, for whatever you're doing. So if you if you do have those already built, you can move them into there to help accelerate whatever markup you're doing. It doesn't necessarily be limited to a markup procedure. It could be if you're doing reinforcement markups and you've got reinforcement tools. If you've got tools for steel beams, right, you might have already tool chests built up for that. You could move them up also up there. So it, it, it's really powerful. and It will speed you up, especially if you're doing a big markup. Instead of having to click across, which is really slow, it's it, it really helps accelerate that markup procedure. Yeah, that's really good. I, I actually had one other one just um, while we can. The, um, the PDF summary that you're using at the end, is that, yes. um, are you finding that there's some uses externally for that as well as just communicating internally? Have you found like um, communicating well, with clients through that PDF summary is useful? Well, well, if, if you've got some ways and you, you want to have some comments behind it, it could be quite useful because you could have that at the end of the document. They can go through that and work it out. And then if they needed to, you've got obviously those hyperlinks back, which are really powerful because it allows you to zoom into it. So you could you could essentially customise it for for whatever you're doing so that, that, yes, there would be procedures if they are using Bluebeam to actually power it for, for whatever markup. So if you needed some change or you needed something moved around, it could... It, they could achieve um well we currently don't use it like that but yes that would could be a work case or a workflow that'd be quite powerful in in a project team with obviously multiple different consultancies i think that's fantastic it's really good um i think i might just sort of throw it back to ben but if anybody's got any more questions for brendan we will have that session at the end which will allow you to sort of have a bit more of an open forum and we can perhaps quiz him a bit further on on his workflow so thank you Yeah, thanks a lot. And yeah, thanks, Brendan. That was um, yeah, really good overview of some of those workflows that are really around efficiencies. And I think that's, you know, some people might take that for granted that they're already doing those things. But for some of the newer users, I think that's really, really quite interesting. And um, it does lead into the next uh, session, um, which, which was a real standout for me from the Discover Bluebeam conference um, quite a few weeks ago now, but um, that was a real standout session for me around implementation of Bluebeam, um, you know, in a pretty pretty quick um, time period and with a really strategic approach to it. And I think that um, that work that, that Brendan showed, I think, you know, that's, um, I think those two tie together really well, um, that once you've got those system set up and in place, you can really um, get that uh, benefits very quickly. So I'll hand it over to Scott now, who's going to give you um, some overview of how Goldra have used Bluebeam um, quite recently. Thanks, Ben. Um, can everyone see my presentation? Is that up? Yep. Good. So um, yeah, as Ben said, we we did this presentation at the Bluebeam conference a uh, month or so ago, I guess. Um, and the aim was just to, I guess, give a bit of a, a story as to how we look to implement this solution in our business. And for anyone who's who's watching this session, you know, hopefully give some tips and tricks as to how to make the the process as smooth as possible. Um, so I'm Scott Gallagher, I'm Digital Engineering Manager for, for Golder. Um, Brad Cantor and also in this session, Phil Corbett will also be uh, helping out as well. Um, this session originally was around about half an hour, maybe 40 minutes. So uh, we're going to cut this down to 15 minutes. So I'm going to smash through some of these slides. Um, Golder as a business, we've been around since uh, 1960s, uh, in Australia since 1972. Uh, employees are around about 7,500 with about 40 offices. Um, as you may have heard recently, and the uh, the socials etc. Um, WSP are acquiring Golder, um, so if that all comes to pass, which is we believe it will, sometime early next year, then uh, yeah, we're going to be a part of a, a bigger organisation. Um, but yeah, uh, our organisation we're known for, and the reason that I guess WSP are, are acquiring us is that um, we do a lot of work in the environmental sciences, geotechnical work, tunnelling work, mining work, especially as well. Um, we have a team of, of experts, both engineers, field staff, um, obviously technical staff as well, um, helping you know provide as as a premium of service to our clients and 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 really you know be at the cutting edge of this specific pocket of uh, engineering work. Um, so with the sort of work that we do and the sort of um, 
way that we deliver, we try and get as much global alignment of the platforms that we use as possible. Um, and one of the things that I found when I moved to Golder, um, so I've been with Golder for a couple of years now, is that their markup processes were a little bit um, uh, different from team to team, group to group, office to office. Um, so I introduced Bluebeam to, to, to the business um, and also, you know, others like Phil, et cetera, would come from external, um, also promoted and, and spoke about its values. Um, so, yeah, as I said, my, my background, I, I actually worked for a technology partner, an Autodesk reseller, and um, so I had good exposure to the platform. Um, so the aim was to really introduce ways of formalizing the market process and making that in um, visibility and transparency as to how everybody worked much, much better. And, you know, Brendan's previous presentation was really good at illustrating that. Um, so once I kind of shown this to some seniors and some principals in the organization, it was agreed that, you know, this this made a lot of sense. Um, so they asked for me to put a, a business case together. Um, so along with people like Phil and, and Brad, who um, were internal champions, I, I put a, a document together. Um, the document outline the internal benefits and um, so you know how we can get better clarity control visibility and um, it's it's standardization across all of the, the the business as to how we do the process but it also gives us some external benefits as well so some um key partners like in the bluebeam conference it was stipulated that the majority of tier one contractors in, in australia and new zealand use bluebeam and um, so having golder aligned to the processes um, that these key platform uh, key partners use in the industry was also beneficial and um, the other part which helped with the rollout was definitely the unfortunately the pandemic um with everybody having to work remotely especially when we're in the depths of it um everyone working from home and um, the usual traditional markup processes that everybody went through were much much harder and um, so adopting a, a platform like bluebeam was definitely going to be beneficial with regards to that um, so a key part of adopting Bluebeam and including the business case was um, making uh, the stakeholders that Gold understand that we would take the base platform and we create tool chests, again, as Brendan spoke to, and workflows that could specifically benefit our teams. Um, the needs of our geotechnical uh, users and engineers would not necessarily be the same as the needs of the design group, um, uh, project managers, etc. So we thought it was important that we make the tools and the workflows um, operate as easy as possible for each individual. Um, so what I'll do is I'll chuck it over to Brad to maybe do a little bit of a show and tell. You there, Brad? Yep, me and Phil are here. Cool. Now, can you share your screen or do I have to stop sharing mine? I guess I can share my screen if you ask nicely. <laughs> okay, pretty please. Okay, there you go. <laughs> nice. All right, you want us to talk? Are we ready? Go for it. Okay, so I'm Brad Canther here in the Brisbane office, and I've got Phil Corbett to my side, the brains trust uh, around most of this Bluebeam <laughs> rollout, really. Um, I'm not going to go into the tool chess. Uh, we're not going to go into the tool chest and everything like that, because I think Brendan did a fantastic job of presenting um, all the great functionality out of that. Obviously, um, we have a tool chest too, um, and we've built our tool chest around sort of a similar concept of, you know, markup colors all being provided and some sort of review system. Um, but I guess the next problem that, and I guess our presentation tacks on quite nicely onto the end of Brendan's is you've set all this up, um, but now you have 100 users. How do you get this out to 100 users efficiently? Um, and particularly when you're in the early stages of its um, development, it's more than likely going to change over time. So how do you then keep rolling this out, um, uh, the changes and communicating with this with, us with users as your user base grows? So we started out with like only, you know, five or 10 users and then quickly grew to about 80 users very quickly. And at the same time, um, Phil's making a lot of changes in the background to our tool chests and to our, our, our workflows. And we want to be able to roll a lot of those changes out quickly um, and effectively to people so that they can get the latest tools to keep everyone on the same page. Um, so we've harness technology we have at Golda here for deploying customizations via Azure. So all the setup that's been done with um, all of these tool chests, um, but we'll, we'll demonstrate briefly, and all the stuff with templates and scale bars and stamps, etc. 
Um, we've loaded that up to Azure on a, on a blob, and we've developed a tiny little installer, and all that does is copies that content down from the cloud into your C drive, into the correct locations, runs a little script to change a few XML settings, and away you go, you set up. And it adds a scheduled task that simply every morning when someone logs in, it checks if there's a new version and just rolls the changes over the top to all those users. Um, I can't go into the dynamics in this, uh, 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 into the technicalities of how all that works, but that's essentially in a nutshell what's happening. If you talk to any of your IT systems guys, I imagine they'll be able to roll something pretty similar in your business. Um, nonetheless, um, so some of the things we have that maybe Phil's probably going to, um, you can maybe roll through at some of the other features on top yeah. of the tool chest that we have uh, rolled out to our users as well. Yeah. So as a part of what we're doing here as, as well, we've also used the Studio Sessions environment to uh, do all our markup and processing. So Brad in front of us has set up something for uh, between the two of us. Um, so as we are using this environment, there's a couple of prerequisites we need to put in place in order to utilize st uh, what was it? statuses and also our markups. So Brad's going to open up for us right now. Uh, so if I go open, I, I don't want to steal the thunder from the last presentation too much, um, but uh, we're sort of branching out on uh, the whole color-based color markup system. Uh, there's another method we can use using status colors. Correct. Um, that Phil's going to show you now. So it, what he has open in front of us is just a PDF, though. Before I play the studio session, very, very quickly, um, we like to use a different different color schemes as well as WSP does, and one of the heavy influence here is statuses. So if we go into the management of the statuses, uh, what we're doing is just utilizing one straight out of the box. Uh, also, they do pass on to other different platforms as well, like Adobe, so we can see these changes actually come through. So if we are limited to not just Bluebeam, we can actually pass this across. And all we're doing is simply modifying that status to change a particular color. So as the user is going through and adding markups, very similar to the other presentation as well, we can have these different color schemes that they can utilize statuses, not just highlighters. And we can check off as things are done, uh, take it off as green essentially, or we'll reject it here as green and uh, complete it as blue. So as the users are using Studio Session and actually doing those markups, um, you'll see that actual visually comes through as well. So. I think we actually had an example uploaded there. Well, uh, yeah, there we so go. one of the things before you upload this to um, uh, the um, studio cloud. sessions, yep. you have to have this set up beforehand or it won't work. Great. You can't change it once it's uploaded. So that when it initially comes in, the status is set to none. But then now with that status change, we can say, you know, that's completed and that automatically turns to blue. So you're not creating, you could essentially just have one set of markups and then just manage the colors through statuses, which are yep. uh, hard coded into Adobe PDFs anyway. So even if you don't have Bluebeam, that status is visible uh, even in a standard PDF, although the color changes don't happen automatically in Adobe. Mm. Um, any color changes you make in Bluebeam do, do reflect in Adobe, um, but the status does reflect it in Adobe too, which is quite useful. Yep. It's a good way of tracking. So in addition to the, the, I don't, like I said, we don't want to steal all the thunder from, from Studio. Um, I, I think we'll let the last presentation cover that. But Phil's gone and um, sort of one of the things that we we want to use Bluebeam for is not just being able to mark up, but also giving engineers um, the ability to create slightly better sketches out of the box with tools. Mm -hmm. So um, we have basically all of our um, title block templates that we've set up. Um, all pre-configed um, in, in with the, the setup that gets delivered via Azure. So engineers can go in here and mash PDF content from imagery or just draw their own lines, et cetera, straight in here and add it onto a title block um, that looks nice and professional compared to, um, uh, I guess, some of the PowerPoint um, presentations that tend to get sent around currently, particularly in our, in our mining group. Um, just looks a little bit cleaner and more professional um, mm -hmm. when they, they, they set it up with decent drawing tools. Sort of a, like, a, like a, it sort of replaces AutoCAD Lite. <laughs> yeah, probably just to expand on that as well, as, as we were going through and actually creating some of the tools um, associated to it, so if you just drop down a profile, 
yeah. domain, yeah, profiles, and then there's a, I brought it out into a couple of different sketching environments, so it made it a little bit easier, so depending on which uh, discipline I was talking to or who was involved with actually using Bluebeam, they could actually go find their own little, little space to go through and do their markups. Um, one in particular, say for instance, if we go to the concrete, um, one thing to bear in mind with uh, going through and setting up a lot of these different tools is scaling as well. So I found it um, pretty important to make sure that uh, you're not just tracing over a, a initial PDF drawings you may have received, you know, typical details, etc. Go through and actually do those to the correct scales. Uh, that way, when you are dropping them onto drawings, so if I just very quickly here calibrate my drawing, let's go say from there to there is about 10 mils, not 10 centimetres. Mills. What it allows us to do is, I'll just drop on a typical masonry section. Uh, oh yeah, so that is technically almost at one as one. <laughs> if I redo that configuration of that scale right there, let's do the same two points. Let's change it from 100 to say 10. So it be a tenth of that size. Oh, sorry, 10 times bigger. Apologies, not a tenth, because I should be going the opposite way. Everything is to scale. Sorry, I went the wrong way around, guys. <laughs> but uh, I found it quite important in order to make sure if you're trying to get these sketches a little bit more accurate than simply just hand sketching and guessing, you can convert a lot of your concrete. Uh, so I come from a structural drafting background, so a lot of it for me is all structural. Um, but in particular, things like steelwork, Seeing that scale prior to actually uploading as individual tools give you that ability to actually give those sketches a little bit more correctly um, drawn rather than just, you know, a couple of lines on a page and, and hoping it's picked up to the right size. So um, what help might be very helpful in actually getting all those together is just make sure you actually have a big, huge matrix set up. I found it a lot easier than to put it into individuals um, and then same as individual tools. Um, Probably the only additional thing I probably would have mentioned there is if you spend money on any one of those tools in there, it was just a decent naming convention as well does help. And uh, if you really want to get a little bit nitty gritty, uh, adding a layer associated to it. So as you are adding markups or sketches to it, you've got the ability to turn off on and off different layers as well. So, uh, so a lot of our markups have a, a standard name up against it. I don't think these ones had layers in the end. Uh, no, they didn't. So, Not if, if you wanted to go a little bit further, certainly something to look at as well. So, thanks, guys. Thanks, so, um, I'll jump back in. I think I've taken control again. I am. Um, so yeah. So, so we basically we set up the the business case and got buy-in from the business. Um, Phil and and Brad set up the environment and set up the the rollout routine, and then the next sort of stage was the actual implementation and integration within our business. So as mentioned earlier, the roller approach was not a one size fits all. Um, so we had initial meetings with senior staff from each discipline to outline the tool um, and discuss the key features so we could both communicate to them and also understand back what they saw as the benefit of Bluebeam to their group. Um, and from this, we created, we created a bespoke training delivery. So um, we don't want Bluebeam to be like a replacement for CAD and as much as um, Phil and Brad were showing some sketching and stuff, that's definitely not the intent and we needed to make sure that that messaging was was brought across, but equally wanted to make sure that we could bring in any specific styles or, or ways that they wanted to be able to sketch. Um, so using Bluebeam um, allowed us to get the team members to better comply with the standards that Goldert has, that it's called games. Um, so rolling out the solution and customizing it in the create in the correct way for each group and each discipline help with compliance with games which was uh, again a, a big thumbs up from everybody um due to the pandemic we couldn't obviously do classroom training we weren't in the office especially in melbourne um so the approach that we took was a blended training approach i've seen success with blended training in my my previous careers um so what um, Phil especially did was he created a, a library of custom gold or content content within Pinnacle. So Pinnacle is um, the online learning platform that we have been using for a little while at Golder, and which we use for a lot of our, our sort of um, civil 3D, CAD, um, Navisworks, et cetera, training. Um, so we created the custom Golder um, training for Bluebeam, as well as having all of the out of the box training that um, that Pinnacle has for Bluebeam. 
And we then married that along with doing uh, two one and a half hour uh, web sessions. So what we did was we gave the, the team um, the prerequisites of doing a couple of just quick modules before we did the first online web training. We then ran the first hour and a half session, really introducing the platform, making them understand when and why they would use the platform. And then a week later, so giving the, the, the users, which is usually for each discipline, each group, it was around about 30 users. It gave them a chance to actually use the platform, give it a go, and then have some questions for the following up sessions. So the last session was a little bit more platform intense. It was less sort of big picture, um, but it went in detail as to how we wanted them to use it and going through things like sessions, um, but also gave them the opportunity to ask some questions or any concerns, misgivings, you know, elements that they wanted clarification on. Just to add to that, um, mm -hmm. uh, while, while you're on that there, we, we actually, because we rolled this deployment out um, so that's the same on everyone's PC, um, we had the ability to actually change the splash page um, when we first deliver the product to give people in-app access directly to this stuff. So like the Pinnacle Series training, they can literally click on a link straight out of here, um, log, log into Pinnacle, Automatic, automatically right, logs yeah. you in and get access to all the stuff that um, Scott's about to show you now, like all the training videos and everything like that. Um, also from our dashboard, you know, we, we can roll like procedures for like how to view, how you're supposed to mark up um, different stuff, like the colors you're supposed to use, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, throw it back to you. Thank you. So yeah, I like how we're playing tag with our screens. That's impressive. Um, <laughs> but what one of the benefits with with having the, the 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 Pinnacle platform as well is that you can create learning paths. So you can see, okay, you know, for for this level of user, for the sort of stock standard person that's um, going to be using it, and um, here's a learning path for you to do. Maybe for the project managers and the people that are going to be doing lots of markups, we can create a separate learning path. So this this screen grab is a little bit out of date, but yeah, so we can keep building and adding to to this um, environment as well, which again, all the users have found very beneficial. And equally, it also means that from our side, we can see who is using the platform to make sure they are actually getting the learning. So they're not just rocking up to the, the web session without doing the prerequisites that we need. The final benefit that we've found from using the Pinnacle platform is it's a, a glo global platform for Golder. So we, I've actually had inquiries from multiple offices in, in Canada and in Europe and North America of people who have actually gone in looked at the, the the videos and said we need this tool so they've approached both phil and myself in in australia and said hey we're you know in the mississauga office in in um in ontario in canada um we need this tool can you do help us with that transition so it's actually helped roll out um bluebeam across the organization in a sort of natural way and um, so again there's a, a challenge with making sure we have enough licenses as teams jump in because some of these teams are are quite substantial mississauga are one of our key mining and um, offices and mining teams and um, but it's 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 proved itself of value and again it's an ongoing uh, resource that people can keep using as a as a refresher as well and that's me uh, thanks everyone for your time any questions thanks. from anybody Thanks, Scott and Dave and Phil. That was uh, um sorry. Uh, that was um yeah, just really really advanced. Really like uh, you've taken that a really long way. It's really quite interesting to see how you've dealt with that. The um there was oh we've lost. Oh, he's gone back. <laughs> He'll come back. There he is. Lost one. There he is. <laughs> Come back. Yeah, you yep, went dark, back. but you're back now. Oh yeah, I'm on some pretty bad internet here. So this is this is the fun of live uh, live things, isn't it? <laughs> um, there was a question there from Dave that was just about how you were dealing with when you're downloading your tool sets from the cloud. Um, is it overriding any changes that users have made to that tool set? And if that's the case, how are you kind of managing um people wanting to make their own tools and actually use their own custom tools yeah one of the things we were worried about is yes certainly um some people might have their own customizations etc this is a very small percentage of users though remembering that we're a business that's just taking it up um so most people don't didn't have anything 
However, uh, we did go to the effort of making sure we only, through the script that deploys uh, both the user preference changes and the profiles and the content, we're actually only injecting our content in. We're not just completely wiping whatever they have. We actually um, pinprick the changes that we need to make um, to some of the user settings. And we're just pumping, changing, changing just those elements and leaving all the other changes that users might have changed. So maybe they've changed a keyboard shortcut or maybe they've changed the color of their background or whatever. We're not really playing with that. We're only just delivering the, our content and then letting them, um, they, they can make all their other changes. Yeah. Yeah, that's excellent. Um, thanks, Phil and Brad, for elaborating on that. Um, I think we'll keep the presentation going, but there was another couple of really good questions in the chat as well. So perhaps we'll just get people to sort of hold them up and we'll address those ones at the end. So thank you, everyone. We'll go back to Ben. Yeah, thanks a lot, guys. Yeah, I, I could yeah listen to this for hours. To be honest, it was really impressive at Discover Bluebeam, and 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 even more so, seeing more detail. I think it just shows you the impact you can have with the strategic approach to it. Um, and yeah, I know our business. We're, we're kind of you know have all these pockets doing different things, and it, you, know, you can see the benefits if we could pull that together um, in a in a more strategic way, which is challenging when you're already uh, quite far progressed into implementing it. But um, yeah, really impressive, I think, how, how it's been adopted. So keen to hear more about that in the future, hopefully. And we'll see uh, with the Golden WSP merger how that plays out as well. Should be interesting. Um, so yeah, next and our final speaker um, is Troy. So first of all, thanks very much to Troy. It's uh, I think close to 8 p.m. over there uh, where he's based in the States. Um, so. Uh, for those of you around the Blue Beam scene, you probably have heard his name before um, and, and probably seen his blog. I think he's got uh, over three years worth of content already up there, but extremely well known around the place. And um, thanks to um, Shan for connecting us, um, but great to have some international um, content in our in our uh, series here. So really keen to hear what Troy has to share with us. So I'll hand it to you, Troy. Awesome. Thank you, guys, and thanks for having me. I'm, I'm honored to be on your platform for sure. Uh, let's see. I'm going to switch over here. Everybody see my screen OK? Yep, we're good. good All fun. right. I'll start with the PowerPoint here. So today I'm just going to go over um, creating and managing sets. Sorry, Troy, we can't hey, see screen. Hey, we can just see you. We see your video, your camera. Well, I don't want that. So we all lied to you, sorry. <laughs> it said well, you were you sharing, but then it Troy, you got less hair on your head, more more hair on your on your chin. I do. I COVID switched it around on me. So, <laughs> so notorious liars here in Australia. We can't help it. Sorry. Last time we spoke, you guys said I wasn't allowed in Australia. So I don't I don't know <laughs> if that's uh, all Americans or just me. <laughs> uh, you're all good now, Matt. We can see everything. <laughs> all right, we're good now. All right, is, are you sure? Now we are. <laughs> good. Right. All yeah. right. So I, I guess to uh, introduce myself, we'll start over. I'll do a better job. Um, my name is Troy DeGroat. I have a blog and YouTube channel called Bluebeam and Burgers. Uh, with that, I try to show tips and tricks in Bluebeam. And then back when I was traveling, I would share some of the crazy burgers that I get wherever I go. So kind of a fun little side segment of the blog there. Um, so you can subscribe and register for those. Uh, Chapter 2 is a company that I actually started last week. Um, I broke off from US CAD and I'm on my own. And so I provide customer specific customization and training to convert your legacy workflows into a digital environment. So I really focus on learning how you're currently doing the work and building the tools so that you're doing the same thing, but digital. So today I'm just gonna go through creating and managing sets. Um, I'll also have you guys make sure that you check out the new built uh, Bluebeam blog as well. They, they've got a lot of great content they're posting out there um, in the slide deck that I gave the team there to share as well. There's a link to two of the articles that I wrote. I've got a handful um, coming up as well, but I go through a workflow on creating 
estimates um, using assemblies, which I didn't hear anybody talking about, so I made up a, a way to do it. Uh, and then I do a lot of government implementations as well, or councils, I think is what you call them out there. So um, doing electronic plan review. Um, so, and then I'll get back to my contact slide here when I'm done. Let's see. Back to Bluebeam. All right, so I'm going to run through. I know there's a lot of questions on the implementation um, that Brad did and tools and stuff, so I want to allow some time there. But I'm going to very quickly go through a workflow that I use to uh, do document management. So right off the bat, I've got a document that has close to 40 sheets here, and you can see that they're named one, two, three. Um, there's three number twos here. You guys probably get these from uh, your customers all the time. And typically you would double click in here and type in the accurate label there. Well, we don't have to do that in Bluebeam. We can just click on create page labels up here. Go ahead and select a region and zoom in down here and draw this box as big as you can inside of the title block. So you don't want to cross over any lines or anything, but if this number grows with an addendum or anything like that, we still want it to fit inside this box. So I'm going to let go, keep my region one in there. It shows me what it's seeing and I'm going to say, okay, make sure it's all the sheets. Okay there. And you can see just that fast, it renamed all of the labels here for me. The next thing that I would do with the extreme version is go into batch. Again, you need the extreme version in order to do these batch functions. I'm going to go into batch link new. I'm going to use my open file. You could also use folders with subfolders if these were all individual documents. So I'm going to say next here. I already fixed the page label, so I'm going to use that as my search criteria. Hit generate. And what this means here is that every time Bluebeam sees A201 throughout this drawing set, it's going to create a hyperlink to page four. Okay, so a trick that I like to show, um, none of these drawings are ever going to reference back to the cover sheet because it's just a 3D rendering and a map to the site. So I'm going to replace this with something that's on every sheet. So I'm just going to take this right here and type in project number. Now, every time it sees that, it's going to jump to page one. And this is on every single sheet. Okay, so I like to look at my options here, include the appearance of a highlight and fill. That'll make all the hyperlinks stand out on my drawing. And then I'm going to click run. It's going to go through this drawing set and look for all of those, create those hyperlinks for me. And just like that, it created 164 hyperlinks. So I'm going to say finish and close. And now if I go back to my cover sheet, I've got my sh uh, sheet index that's now activated. I can go look at my construction plan level one. I can click on this blow up view, the section cut, and then on every single page, I have this home button that jumps me back to my sheet index. Okay, so that's how I get all these hyperlinks to work. The next step, I go over to the thumbnails over here, right click, and there's a lot of tools in here. This tool, uh, tool panel looks pretty plain, but there's a lot of things you can do when you right click. So I'm gonna extract all these pages. Make sure I select all. Um, I'm not gonna worry about deleting those. I wanna extract those into separate files. That's what I'm trying to do. And I wanna use the page label to rename those. Uh, the folder I'm putting them in is empty. I don't have to worry about this override. Um, I don't want to open all of them after they're extracted. I don't want 40 tabs across the top. And then I want to make sure that the hyperlinks are um, staying relative so they still work. So I'm going to say, okay. It's going to ask me where to save those. So I'm going to come up here and put it in my current set. And it's going to extract all those. So I'm going to go to my Windows Explorer, and you can see here that all those drawings are now in here, and they're all named according to that label that we created. Next thing I'm going to do, I can actually close this. I don't need that open anymore. I'm going to go to my Sets tab, 
And if your sets are not in here, you can simply right click down in this black area, go to show and go down and it looks like sets was maybe on the other side. So I'll put those over on this side. And here I'm just going to go new set. This is just a pop up that tells you what sets are. Sets allow you to view a collection of individual sheets as if they are a single document. So I'm going to say OK here. And I'm going to go to add. I'm going to point to a folder where those drawings are. Select and you can see it loaded all of those drawings in here. Next thing I'm going to do is click OK. And it's going to ask me to create some tags on these sheets. So add a tag for the sheet name. I'm going to go select. Go down to the sheet name. Draw this box big enough again. If there's uh, more lines to that text or that title, it'll still fit inside here. Say OK. Next, it wants the sheet number. So I'm going to do that again here. Say OK. And then it gives me a report of everything it found. If there's any uh, misspellings or anything that it sees, you can actually click in here and come up here and modify those. Um, for the most part, it does a good job. So I'm going to click OK. And it's going to create the set for me. So it's finding all those tags and making sure that it creates my set. And what you'll see here is that it recognized the G in front of all of those sheet numbers and it put them under general and architectural. So it automatically um, puts these in categories according to the discipline. So I can come in here and you'll notice that only one sheet is open, my A100. If I click on here, it'll close that one and open the sheet that I asked it to open. So that's how you build a set. And there were some questions also earlier about Studio and those reports that you create, the summaries of the markups. When I teach um, doing plan reviews and things like that, I like to build a set and then save that in a Studio project because then I can still create that report. If there's any sheets that two or more people need to collaborate on at the same time, I'll just right click on that sheet in the project and send it to a session temporarily. Do my coordination and send it back to the project. Then I'm always working from the project. Um, I use Studio as very temporarily um, collaborating with somebody else. So back to sets. Um, here I've got this all created. And one of the great things that we can do here with the batch tools again, this is in the extreme version, is come down here to slip sheet. And this is going to allow me to set my current files as my open files or my open set. And then my revised files, I'm going to go out and navigate to a folder again. So I'm going to go select revision two. There's three drawings that were changed and those were sent to me. So I'm going to click on match pages. Because they're named similar, it actually finds those and pairs those up. The ones that were changed and then in here there's two options to replace the current page with the revised page or insert revised pages before the current page. I like to select that one because it allows me to basically stack the versions so I can see the previous version still. These check marks here, it's going to copy markups from the current pages to the revised pages. Um, it'll unflatten if we want them to. Uh, the other big one here is to stamp the current page superseded. So I'm telling it to stamp the old one and bring all the markups forward. I'm going to click OK. That's particularly important if you're doing estimates or anything like that and you've gone ahead and drawn on top of your um, on top of your drawings and then something changes, a room size changes or something like that, you can just modify the markups when they pull onto the next sheet instead of starting over. Uh, once I run that, it wants to create a detailed summary report of that slip sheet. Um, I'm not going to do that this time. It's It creates a eight and a half by 11 report just saying this hyperlink was replaced by this hyperlink. So you can um, 
keep those in those revision folders. So I'm just going to hit OK, and then you'll see here that there's a little arrow. And that indicates that there's a drawing behind it. So that's my superseded sheet. And when I click forward, I can see the new version. So that's how you can track all your versionings. Just keep sliding those new revisions in. And what's neat here too is if I right click on the drawing that has a previous one uh, underneath it, I can come in and compare documents as well. And it'll create a third document with everything clouded, the changes that it found between the two documents. So I know I went fast. I That's all I had to show you guys. Um, if there's questions, by all means, let me know. Um, I actually do have one, uh, Troy. Mm -hmm. What's the difference between doing the batch slip sheet? What advantage does that give you over just adding files to the set and replacing? Like, so using the add files at the top of the sets. Um, tab? So just adding those in there. Um, yep. You can add those in there, in there to build up the set. I like to do the slip sheet because it, it makes, I think when you add, it actually puts it as a new sheet underneath. So you'll have A201, A201. Uh, when you do the slip sheet, it does a nice job of putting them on top of each other so that you know it's a replacement sheet, not an additional sheet. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I think like we do use the sets function a lot and we sort of tend to just go add and it, it looks quite different, the process, but it does actually still layer. If you've got your naming oh, right, it's still that over the okay. top. But, um, I'm sort of interested to try this way now just to see if it has a better performance. And that would be that would be a way to do it if you don't have batch, the extreme version. Yeah. Uh, yeah, good point. Um, well, I, there isn't too many other questions coming through on the line, but I, I think um, if anybody's got any questions from uh, regarding to any of the speakers, and especially to Troy's one there at the end, um, I think we'd just sort of throw open the lines and let people um, if it, just leave it for a few moments. And uh, if anybody wants to chime in, now's a good time. Yeah, here's all my contact info. Um, if you want to get a hold of me for anything, let me know. I'm always willing to help. And you can cut off my screen whenever you want, sir. I like what you're doing with, uh, <clears throat> with the set, so because it encourages people to add more markups, which is effectively data to the PDF. Because it copies and pastes them across, you just get smarter and smarter information on your PDF. It's a good way to add to the, the story, if you will, of the project. Right. Can you can you compare the previous versions like of just one drawing like on screen? Is that is that the, one of the advantages of sets? Like, can you sort of see the difference sort of thing? With the document compare like I did? Is that what you mean? Yeah, I must have missed that bit. Sorry. No, that's OK. Yeah, I just I right clicked on the document within the set and switch. Uh, back here you can see that the drawing has two versions here and i just right clicked on that and i did a compare documents and that's what produced this um ah yeah okay thanks and then you can also do the overlay which would show like a light table each one over top of each other when we um uh, acom we use it to track our drafting markups so where it works quite well is when you've got markups on a sheet and when you uh, add your new sheet to it, it will ask you if you want to um, copy across the previous markups. So what it will automatically copy on your previous markups onto the updated background and it mm -hmm. makes it very good for back checking because you can go through and actually see the markup that you had on top of the updated document that should be matching and then because the previous issue, the superseded one, still has your markups on it and you can still navigate back to it, it means that on the new document, when I look at it and go, um, the background's been updated, I can just delete off that comment 
and just go through and delete them all off until it's a clean document or change them back into a red color or something if I want, if I realize that it hasn't been updated and we want our um, drafters to sort of go and do something further on that. Right, right. In theory, everywhere that you had a markup, if we run the document compare, there should be a cloud there indicating something yeah. was updated. That's yeah, a good way to backtrack. Yeah. Yeah, one um, <clears throat> one problem we have had though, um, and Lachlan will probably be aware of, you know, we, we kind of adopted Bluebeam because of the sets functionality many years ago, um, and it was large projects where we had a lot of drawings and those projects run for a long time. But the lesson we learned the hard way probably was that we need to restart the set um, at a re regular kind of occurrence, especially maybe after milestones, after sort of three months of um, batch slip sheeting or, or however we were doing it. We were using batch slip sheeting then. Um, the, the sets files would start to get a little bit unstable. Um, have you had any experience with that, Troy, with sets? Just, you know, adding too much to it and then it, it's, it starts to have some issues? I haven't. Um, I, I've only heard that maybe a couple times. So I, I wouldn't doubt it if you have a large set and you're slipping in additional sheets here and there. But like you said, there's milestones where you're not starting over, but you kind of are. Like this is the set. Um, this is the schematic design set. And then yeah. Yeah. everything else after that you know would be a new set so that's i think that's a good practice for sure yeah yeah some of those would run for maybe three months and you would probably update them at least maybe three times a week so it starts to add up with a with a large history i guess there's actually a question in the chat um troy that you might be able to help with it's not related to sets but uh, Ivana was just asking, she said they recently updated to 2019 Bluebeam and the default measurements are constantly in Imperial units and it doesn't be, appear to be a way to make it default back to SI units. So you're always having to go and fix it up every time. Is this something that you've come across or heard about? Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm always in Imperial. <laughs> I think uh, <laughs> you might want to double check that you have the right download. That it's might to do with the, uh, when you when you first install it, there's a, a UK or US yeah. installation. But I'll be honest, I can't. Uh, Zoe is just saying in, in the in the changing the settings, but I couldn't find it. There's spelling settings and different settings, but I couldn't see it where it was to change the units. In grid and snap. Grid and snap. Under units. Does okay. that actually change the default for? Bill's telling me that changes it to metric. It should stay okay. metric. So. It's good. Good crowdsource fix of that problem. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> so when you go to import, what's your drop down, Troy? Go to your drop down at the top. Yeah, it's still Imperial. That should fix it. Mm. That's quite interesting. Maybe it's something that we should. Uh, no, Brad was. Talking. Brad was showing a screen capture. <laughs> it's the language. <laughs> was there somewhere else that you wanted me to show? Uh, in the language, you changed English US to UK. I think default to metric. People are saying. Okay. I hope that works. Go on, English UK. You know you want to do it. <laughs> 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 Let's see. And then this was still. Oh, look, it's a centimeter. Exciting. That was <laughs> from my previous set, I believe. Oh. Oh, no. Do you want to do that? Sure, why not? Yeah, okay. Maybe table that one. Ivana says it, that doesn't fix it. Um, 
I don't know if we have any right more questions just at this point in time. So um, maybe Ben, if you want to sort of uh, take back and uh, introduce Shan just to do his news update. And um, if anybody has any more questions after that, we can probably still I, keep on the line at the end and we can have a little chat. I have two uh, short questions for Golder. I don't know if you guys can hear me in Pia. And I'm in Dallas, close to Troy, I think. Um, on when you do the statuses and you said that it moves over to Adobe, do custom statuses also do that or only the ones that are out of the box Bluebeam? That's my first question. And then the second question was, I saw that you guys had a lot of locked tool chests, which I personally really liked. My question was more, does it, do you house those in your server somewhere or do you all, do those get moved to the people's C drive and then you also lock them there so that you can override them? Uh, wasn't sure which way you were doing it. So, uh, I mean, our, our tool sets get delivered to the C drive and then they're locked in there. So when the users open it, that's it, it shows the tool sets is locked by default. Correct. Okay, but so all, you're not it, locking it, them it, in it, a it, server somewhere? No, no. It's, so if you're not connected to the server in any way, uh, it's, it's like a one-time download. Um, and it will it checks every time you log in to see if there's a new version and it will replace those tools as required. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And the statuses, do you know if you create custom statuses if those also transfer to Adobe? I think we looked at this before the custom yeah. statuses. I don't think they did. They don't transfer, yeah. So yeah. those those statuses you saw like approved, rejected, cancelled, they're actually the default Adobe statuses, and they're the only ones that really show in, in Adobe. Yeah. All right, thank you. It's probably the, like the PDF ISO standards, so we're taking advantage of using those. All right, that's great. Um, yeah, thanks very much to Troy. Uh, we'll share that content as well, as, uh, along with the video. And uh, there are plenty of links there, but if you if you do want to follow up with Troy, um, check out his blog. Pretty easy to find either just through the web or LinkedIn or, or YouTube. Plenty of content out there, but that was yeah really good. And if you're not using sets, definitely look at it. Um, it's a huge, huge workflow for large projects. Um, so yeah, I didn't mention at the start, but we are celebrating our first year. Uh, Bluebeam has come on board. Um, we've got a lot of signups today. I tried a few ways to filter to make sure that we were getting this out. We can't um, provide this to everyone, um, but we thought um, it would be good, good chance uh, it was to the early signups. Um, but probably about half of the half of the group would have received the gift card from Bluebeam. Um, so. Maybe you've already ordered something and it's on its way. Maybe it's a burger to enjoy with Troy's talk. Um, we'll see. But uh, yeah, thanks every, everyone. And I think those early people that signed up were the regular attendees. We've got a lot of people that have been here since our first one back in March. So that's great to see. And uh, we'll hope to do that again in the future. Maybe an in-person one. I've still got a bunch of those uh, water bottles and <laughs> other paraphernalia we had at our first one sitting in my office somewhere so um we'll get those out to people uh yeah and hand it over to shan now just to share some new news to round out the uh the session today all righty uh, let me see if i got the uh all right all right so a bit of news a bit of digging around so review 20.1 is coming out sometime soonish there's no set date it's in beta testing at the moment. So some things I can tell you is the transfer of your markup ownership inside Studio Sessions. So it was interesting seeing your markup before and I haven't played with it in the, my beta version. I, I haven't been able to get to it, but I'm hoping at least because there's a workflow where people put stuff up to the session, they bring it down and then make some edits and push it back up to a session again and they can't change their previous markups. So you might be able to assign those to an individual person, like an admin or something. I'm not quite sure. Um, there's an update to the SharePoint integration. So um, I should be testing that. I'm not really sure what it does just yet, to be honest, or how much better it works. But I think it was Explorer 11 that you had to have on your computer before to get a SharePoint integration. Um, so looking forward to that. Um, so yeah. Maybe January, I'm guessing, because Bluebeam are now doing quarterly updates for people who are on um, uh, subscription and such. 
Um, the shouldn't say subscription. Uh, the Germany has a local server, probably not so good for us here in Oz, but I guess you've got a, a global company like Golda. Well, maybe you've got some German people over there as well. Um, you've got a studio server. Now, on the social media, um, I thought I'd just bring out some more reading for people to do. Uh, Bluebeam have their own blog. The Bluebeam blog sounds pretty simple and straightforward. So there's a picture of that. That's come through recently. Um, what else do we have? I won't go through anything in particular in it. Um, bugs from around the world. Um, very proud to say it's it's mainly us in Australia. Sydney, uh, Russell, well done. I think you're out there and ourselves. So we'll have our third one. Russell's got three up there already. Um, as Ben said, it's, it's worth seeing what other countries are doing, by the way. Um, just there's always different ways to read into how you use Bluebeam and different workflows and just those little nuggets of, uh, of gold of information. Let's see. To our Bluebeam social ads, you've probably seen on LinkedIn on, and on Facebook and so forth. There's been a quite a few ads coming through. Uh, Troy, yes, you picked out your one earlier. Um, it was assemblies, but I, I like them because it's, it's short. We all got uh, short attention spans. But uh, little nuggets of gold, once again, that you can take through and just add to your swagger tricks, I guess. The, from the Building Smart, uh, right now, uh, we've got the Australia Build Week. Um, I saw something a little bit earlier today. Um, the presentation's finishing on the 11th, but uh, it's wrapping up for the year, and I don't think there's too many Christmas parties as such, so uh, there's nothing else I could see on Building Smart. Uh, let's see. Uh, and on the uh, global bugs, so I had a bit of a look around um, on Bluebeam's events page, I should point it out. So we've got Austin. Um, these are Australian times and dates I've put into here. So I'll be missing this one. It's uh, although, uh, let me see, we've got uh, Terry, I think he's talking this week. Um, so that's Friday, uh, 5 a.m. <laughs> Good luck with that one. Uh, Chicago, though, we can do that one. That's going to be at uh, 10 to 11 a.m. Then Salt Lake City is going to be on Saturday morning. I don't think I'll be there for that one. I'll be sleeping in. For That's uh, 5 to 6 a.m. Next part, I just thought I'd bring up to everyone's uh, attention, is um, some related news with the tech support. Just to help out, some issues going on at the moment with the iPad crashing. Um, there's no set data when that's going to be fixed hopefully soon. But I just want to point out with, uh, even though we haven't got 20.1 yet, there's some other updates that come out recently. So here's just a short list. You can get a whole list of them from the article, probably send it through to you, Ben. You can put it onto our little show notes. But uh, some simple ones, like even text boxes, freezing, um, review, that's all been fixed. Scrolling's been fixed. Um, there was a Windows up update that's been fixed. So. Uh, Review 20 has been proven to be quite robust, a couple little bugs here and there, but uh, it's definitely not Review 18 as such. So uh, that's all good news. All right, that's it for the news. Back to you, Ben. All right, thanks, Ben. Uh, so yeah, just finally wrapping up now. Um, first of all, obviously, you know, we're already thinking about next year, so uh, we'll uh, Yes, that's right. Yeah, so about March 9th, we'll we'll have a think about that. We'll see how the lunchtime's gone. We've had good attendance today, so um, be keen to uh, look at that. Um, we might get organised and send out a survey this time just to see what everyone's interested in. Um, but yeah, first and foremost, if you've got some interesting topics, get in touch with any of us. Um, otherwise, we'll be chasing you guys up pretty soon. Uh, I know there's a lot happening. Already, um, we probably tried to jam too much into this already, I think. So maybe it, some of it needs a bit more detail and uh, join that Melbug uh, LinkedIn group to keep updated. Um, we do have a contact email there, uh, but that group is uh, a, a good way to keep in the loop. Um, but we do share our events around with the other calendars as well. So you will you will hear about it. Um, yeah, and as I said, also um, keep an eye out on that uh, YouTube channel. You'll find the, the content there as well. You can go back to it. There's been a lot of good content here today. Um, and for all the attendees, we'll send out the uh, the slide deck with the links that you can access as well um, via our, our studio uh, project um, once we co collate that in the next week. But um, yeah, thanks for everyone. Um, 
and uh, enjoy the uh, relaxing restrictions if you are here in Melbourne over the next few weeks. And hopefully you can um, have some catch-ups with your, your teams before you go away and maybe even get into the off But, um, yeah, really thank everyone um, for the great attendance and particularly all our speakers today. I think you'll agree. There was some excellent content there and um, really enjoyable once again. So thanks a lot. Hey, Ben, is our studio project on the Australian server or is it still on the US server? Uh, we're still on the US at the moment. Yeah, yeah, we could port that across. But yeah, don't, it's, uh, it's probably a bit annoying for the Australians to have to log out. Um, but uh, it's, uh, it's a bit tricky. Mm. As long as your passwords match, that's the most confusing thing if you accidentally <laughs> create two different passwords. <laughs> All right, yeah, we'll wrap it up there, but uh, thanks very much, everyone, and...